See, God deals with all of us uniquely, but you'll find there are certain patterns in the way he deals with everybody. It's amazing the similarity in experience that Christians have. And so by looking at the way he dealt with those in the Old Testament, those he de- way he dealt with those in the New Testament, we can see how he deals with us, how he's going to deal with us. And so we're looking at the lives of men and women in the, in the uh, scripture. And today we're going to look at Abraham, but not his whole life, a particular uh, situation in his life, a particular part of his life where he offered Isaac uh, as a sacrifice, or at least went to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And that's in Genesis chapter 2. So we're going to look at that, and we're going to just read it together. If you want to open in the, your phone Bible, or if you a hard copy Bible, or if you just want to read along with me, we're, going to read, we're just going to read it. It's, a, it's just one chapter. The whole story is in one chapter. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward, and you're probably familiar with it. But as we go through it, um, two things. I want to point out just some interesting little Uh, details in the story that are easily overlooked. And then we're going to draw three principles from this uh, story that apply to our life, that we can learn, that we can learn again from the life of Abraham, how it applies to our life. So, Genesis chapter 22, and we're just going to start reading in uh, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Let's stop right there. We're, we're going to take a while to get through Genesis 22. <laughs> God tested Abraham. I think that's fascinating, isn't it? Who started? Uh, Abraham is getting ready to have a heart and gut-wrenching experience. Who started this whole thing? Abraham's just minding his own business, going through life, serving God, doing what, and all of a sudden God tests Abraham. It's like Job. Job was just minding his own business, and who started Job's problems? Who started Job's problems? It, it wasn't the devil. It says that Satan was up there talking with God, and God says, hey, have you taken notice of my servant Job? I say, God, please don't ever do that to the devil with me. I just, I want to be under his radar, you know. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want the attention of the enemy. Um, but the Lord started his problems. And many times, I'm convinced that in our life, too, we, we, find a, we, we find ourselves in a stressful situation or we find ourselves in a difficult situation, and it's God-inspired thing. It's something that God has brought into our life. And what is he doing here? It says God tested Abraham. And we read in the New Testament that our faith is tested like gold is tried in fire. Our faith, in the same way, is tried in fire, only our faith is much more precious than gold, it says. But our faith becomes stronger and becomes purer and just as Abraham's did here, through those testings, through those difficult times. So God brings those things into our life, but it's not for our harm, it's for our good. So sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Wow. Those, those you know, there were times when uh, I was raising my kids that I was kind of thinking it'd be nice if the Lord would allow me to take them out and offer them as a sacrifice on a mountain. <laughs> it's like, oh God, this would be so wonderful. But not really. When you think about what this was really, he's really asking him to do. Think about your child, you know, the one you like, not the other two. Think about your kids. <laughs> Um, and to take them and plunge a knife into their heart. I mean, first of all, man, I just I can't imagine the trauma of that. But then to light, it's a burnt offering. Then you're going to light a fire and watch their flesh begin to burn and be there and smell the smell and watch the It's like, wow, are you, I, I can't imagine uh, what that really, what, what a, request that was of God and what he was asking him to do a burnt offering on the mountain and, and of course we can't miss the uh, I mean it's, it's hard to miss the parallel here of what he's asking Abraham to do take your son he emphasizes your only son which of course he had Ishmael at that time too but he's saying this is the son of the promise just as Jesus the son of the promise take your only son sacrifice him. What he's asking Abraham to do is what he would do. 
some thousand years later on the cross, sacrificing his own son. And so he asks Abraham to do that. And, and you know, it's interesting here because we don't see any, well, why God? Or, well, Lord, are you sure? Is that, I mean, there's no argument. Now, maybe there was, and I was certainly thinking in his own heart there was some back and forth, but there's no record of that. In fact, it says then, verse 3, early the next morning, so they say, what well, early the next morning, he gets up and he loads his donkey. He didn't delay his obedience, even though this was something, wow, this was such a big ask. But early the next morning, he gets up, he loads his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. <clears throat> when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. Now I think it's significant. You know, when God gives us details, he doesn't just throw things in there for no reason. But this is, again, he is picturing here what he's going to do to his own son. Three days, they travel. It's not just so you know how far they had to go, but it's like from the very moment that Abraham heard God and determined he was going to obey. From that moment in his heart, in his mind, Isaac was dead. And so he's dead for one day, two days, three days. The third day they get to the place. He goes up, he goes to offer Isaac, and it's as though Isaac is given back to him in life. And so we see again just a beautiful picture of what the father would do. Three days, dead, Isaac then comes back. So he says to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then this next line too is very important. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Interesting. Was he just not wanting to let the servants in? You know, there's also no mention that he says to Sarah what he's doing. Maybe that's why he got up early, so Sarah wouldn't ask, where are you going? <laughs> he didn't want to have to talk to her about it. But he doesn't, he, he doesn't tell these servants, he says, we'll be back, we'll be back. You go, how, how did he reason that? Well, we, we see some insight in, in Hebrews that tells us that Abraham, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. It says he offered him as a sacrifice. He really did. He was given back. He didn't have to go through with it, but he, off, he did give he offered that sacrifice he offered him as a sacrifice he who had embraced the promises and i like that by now abraham had embraced the promises when he was first told you're gonna have a son through sarah well maybe you know I, I i believe god but well let's try this other thing here since it doesn't seem to be happening and ishmael was the product of that but now he has embraced these promises so he says okay god you want me to do this you have said, because he goes on, because uh, his only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac your offspring, will be, your promise will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. And so now it's like he's figured, okay, um, this is the son of the promise. I don't know how this driving a knife into his heart, burning my son, I don't know how that fits into this all coming about. But I've embraced the promise now. I know God is going to do it. And so I'm going to obey God in this. He can even raise him from the dead. And so, uh, that's, so he goes on and he does that. So let's read on here. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering. So he's left the servants there. He takes the wood for the burnt offering. And he placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And again, I think that's important. The wood, Abraham didn't carry the wood. He placed that on Isaac, just as his own son would bear the wooden cross. But Abraham carried the knife and the fire because it was Abraham who was going to use the knife and burn his son alive. Or not alive, he would be dead by then. And so he carries the fire. You know, they're, they're in the uh, Middle Ages, you know, they, they persecuted the Jews, calling them Jesus killers, you know. And, and the question comes up sometimes, did the Jews kill? Who killed Jesus? Was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? 
Was it our sin? Well, true. All three are true. But in reality, it was the Father himself. There's an there's a incredible passage in Isaiah 53. It says, the Lord, speaking of Jesus, it's a, it's, a, it's a very clear prophecy of Jesus, Isaiah 53. You read it. And then it says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Some of the other versions, that's the New, New American Standard. I think the King James says that as well. The Lord was pleased to crush him. Some of the other versions kind of tone that down and write it. Yet it was the Lord's good pleasure, or it was the Lord's good will to do this. And all of those are true. But how could God take pleasure in that? Well, in that very passage, it tells us because he knew that through that there would come a great inheritance, that many would be brought into the kingdom through that crushing of his own son. And so the Lord took, took pleasure. In so who really sent Jesus to the cross? It was God the Father. And Jesus went in obedience to God the Father, not because the Romans had control over him or not because the Jews had superiority over him, but by his own choice, in obedience to his Father's will that he go to the cross. And why did he do that? It wasn't for Jesus, it was for us that he did that. And that's the reason Jesus, Jesus, I don't even think Jesus necessarily did it for us either. The Father did it for us. Jesus did it in obedience to the Father, if that's what you want, Father. And that's the incredible thing about this. When, when they get up there, we're going to look at this and see, Isaac was not this little 8 or 10-year-old boy. If you do the numbers, he was probably maybe 30s, late 20s or maybe 30s. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if he was 33, the same age Jesus was offered as a sacrifice. We don't know for sure. But he was not a little boy. And Abraham's over 100 years old. You think, a, you think his son could have resisted him and fought with him? And we have no record of him fighting at all with Abraham and Abraham having to you know, battle him to get him to do this. So let's read on. Uh, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering. He placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac noticed something, and he spoke up. Father? Yes, son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And I love this next statement. Abraham replies, and it's, it's a prophetic statement as well. God himself will provide the lamb. Now, of course, when they get up there, it wasn't really a lamb that was provided there. So we see this is really a prophetic statement of Jesus. It was really a ram, a, a grown lamb, male lamb that was offered. But this lamb, Jesus is the lamb of God. And I love this. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. What a, what a prophetic statement of what was to come. And the two of them went on together. Now, when they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there, and he arranged the wood on it. Now, where, where is that place? Well, verse 2 tells us it was in the land of Moriah. And so, you've seen a picture of the place where they went. And it's um, a very famous picture. It's in Jerusalem. This gold-covered dome is not a mosque. There is a mosque there, Al-Aqsa Al Mosque. But that is the Dome of the Rock. It is not a mosque. It was built over this big rock, a rock that, uh, well, actually in Muslim, uh, and, and some people believe this is where God first created the earth. This is where Adam was created. I, I think the Tigris and Euphrates kind of tell us it was not there, but because uh, Eden had the Tigris and Euphrates flowing through it. Of course, the flood could have moved all that. But, but, the, but that is the rock where Muslims believe that, Abraham, that um, Muhammad began his night journey. Uh, we believe that that is probably the rock where uh, Abraham offered Isaac. This is Moriah, Mount Moriah, where that is. Today, the Jews call it Temple Mount because that is where the first temple, Solomon's temple, sat. It is where, then that temple was, as you know, torn down by Nebuchadnezzar when they were carried off into Babylon. When they came back under Ezra and Nehemiah, the second temple was built there. That's the temple that Jesus entered, which is really fascinating because uh, when they were seeing the second temple, it wasn't as glorious as Solomon's temple. It wasn't as magnificent as Solomon's temple. And the old people, because they weren't in exile that long, some of the people had seen that first temple carried into exile as kids, came back and saw the second temple, and they're weeping and they're crying because this isn't as glorious as our old temple. Oh, we remember that old temple. Of course, as kids, we kind of remember things as bigger than they really were anyway, right? But they're weeping, 
And that's where we get that passage where it says, Stop weeping. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And it says, and it says something really fascinating. It says, The glory of this second temple will be greater than the glory of the first temple. And if you're just looking at it in the natural realm, you look at it and you go, doesn't have as much gold, doesn't have as much, it doesn't blah, 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 blah. But this is the temple. In the first temple, you remember when Solomon dedicated it, the presence of the Lord came down and the priests couldn't minister. They had to pull back. It was so glorious. But in the second temple, the glory of the presence of God came in the form of Jesus. That's the temple he entered. And so the glory of the second temple was greater than the glory of the first temple. And so that's where Temple 1, Temple 2, and then that temple was torn down in 70 A.D. when Titus, the Romans, came in and, and put down a rebellion and destroyed the temple. So that was torn. And then in 600, 668, something like that, the Muslims began to build this, this, this um, dome over this sacred rock. It's called the Foundation Stone or the Noble Stone or the Sacred Rock. And so they built this over it. And that's why it's such a sacred place to the Muslims, but it also is to the Christians. Now, this is a picture actually we took. This is the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall of the old temple grounds. And the reason I put that up there too is to see how close it is. This is a picture from the east, east looking, uh, probably, probably taken from Mount of Olives, maybe a little bit, but it was probably taken from the Mount of Olives, looking at the east down on Jerusalem. This is from inside Jerusalem, the old city. And you can see how close they are together to the Wailing Wall. It's part of the same structure there. And this, this is just, this is icing on the cake. When we were, we were our first trip to Israel, we were visiting with, um, we were visiting some of our missionaries there. And all of our missionaries at that time worked with the Arabs in Arab areas. We were able to get on to the Temple Mount. Now, of course, the Muslims would not call it the Temple Mount. They don't, it's the, uh, it's the Mount of uh, where the um, Al-Aqsa Mosque is, the mosque area. But he pointed this little gazebo that's sitting out there in the middle of nowhere. It's like, what is that doing there? It's too tiny to even have any kind of an event in it. And he was, he not, not only was he a missionary to the Arabs there, <coughs> but he um, was quite an archaeologist, a study of archaeology, and loved to study things there. And so he had discovered that this is probably where the Holy of Holies was in the temple. And for some reason, that, ma, that little gazebo is allowed to stand there. And he pointed out to us, and then we saw a picture of it, actually. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you know, they say that, well, there's going to be a third temple built. Scripture talks about that. And, of course, everybody says, well, that can't happen until the Dome of the Rock is destroyed and the mosque is destroyed. Not, not so. If that is indeed where the Holy of Holies is, there are pictures. There's actually architectural-type drawings over there where the third temple can be built right next to the Dome of the Rock, not interfering with the Dome of the Rock, not interfering with the Al-Aqsa Mosque, <laughs> can be built right there on Temple Mount. So, that, and you know, I'd always heard these stories about, um, oh, they're already preparing, they're already preparing the special incense, because you know, there was used special incense, special oils that had to be prepared, all that kind of stuff for the temple, and they've already, they're already re recreating the, uh, the instruments that are used to worship over there, the special plates and all that. <coughs> I was watching like a National Geographic or something. And they actually interviewed the guys that are responsible for guarding all that stuff. I kind of thought it was one of those evangelistic stories, you know, like, oh, they're already doing it. I go, yeah, probably not. They really are. This, a temple could be constructed really quickly, a third temple right there, without destroying the mosque, without destroying the, the Dome of the Rock. And they are, they've got things prepared to go, all the instruments needed and all the equipment and uh, paraphernalia for, for the worship. Well, let's get back to Abraham, okay? Verse 10, uh, well, verse 9, when they reached the place God had told them about, boom, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar and he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And again, he says, here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. And here's, you do what you want to in your theology with this. He says, now I know. Now I know. 
you didn't know before? Now I know. Now I know that you fear God. Why? Because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and he took the ram. He sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son, which again is a picture of that, uh, that replacement, that uh, substitution that this ram died in place of Isaac just as Jesus died in place of us. We're the ones that should have been, should have been slaughtered. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. That became a saying among the people. Well, got a problem. Well, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. It's a good saying, isn't it? It's a good one for us to hold on to. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So this is a, this is a wonderful story, right? It's a great story, but that's because we know what's going to happen. Abraham didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, this was a hard, hard test for him. Very, very difficult. Hard. He was fully expecting, I don't know, God's going to bring him back to life or what, but I've got to do this and set him on fire. And he was fully expecting to do that. But look what happened. That was a pit. That was a deep valley, I'm sure, for those three days that he was walking and knowing in his heart what was about to happen. A deep, deep valley. But look what happens then on the other side of this, on the other side of obedience. On the other side of obedience, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And he said, I swear by myself. So this isn't just an angel. It's the Lord himself saying, I swear by myself. And again, that's because there's nobody bigger or better he can swear by. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, I will surely bless you. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand in the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Still seeing that happen today, aren't we? And through your offspring, now there's the, there's the physical of that that's still happening today, but we're concerned with the spiritual of that. Again, what's physical in the Old Testament is spiritual in the New Testament. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, but we are to be taking possession of the cities of the enemies. We're to be taking possession, and our enemies are the principalities and powers, the rulers of wickedness in high places. And we're to be taking, taking back from them. And what we're to be taking back are the spoils of war, which are the people that are held in captivity by them. That's the true treasure that we are, we are all about taking back. And so those people that sometimes we think are the enemy of the kingdom, they're many times just the slaves that we're to be rescuing and setting free. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of their enemy and through your offspring, I love this, all nations on earth will be blessed. Why? Because you have obeyed me. Wow. This was a deep, deep pit. But the blessing on the other side is probably the greatest blessing ever pronounced on anyone other than Jesus himself who said, because you've obeyed, you now have been given a name that's above every name, that it's your name every knee shall bow. And so I want to look at principle number one. We see this, that because of his obedience, all nations on earth are blessed. And principle number one simply says that our obedience or our disobedience doesn't just affect us. God is a generational God. He is, he is interested in impacting the nations through us. And just like you take a calm, quiet pool, you drop a stone into it, that action has a rippling effect that goes out in every direction. Our obedience and our, or our disobedience has an impact upon those around us in every direction, those closest to us and those far out as well. And so, number one, he's a generational God. He wants to bring blessing through us to our kids, to our grandkids, to, to neighbors. He wants to be a blessing through us, through obedience. It doesn't just affect us. Our obedience or disobedience affects all those around us. Um, and I love the fact that, he, you know, God, again, doesn't just uh, randomly use words and examples. Look up here. He says, I will bless your descendants. I will make them as numerous as one, stars in the sky. Numerous as two, sands of the seashore. Why those two examples? Just to really overemphasize? Maybe, but I believe we're seeing something here, too. He's showing you're going to have two types of descendants. There are those descendants that are of the earth, natural. 
the Jewish nation, all those that are descended out of Abraham and his, his descendants, all those, that's, those are your descendants of the earthly. But he also says your descendants are going to be numerous as the stars of the sky. There are going to be those heavenly descendants. As, as Jesus put it, he said, those not born, well, I guess it's John who put it this way in 1 John, though, or John 1, those not born of the will of man, but born of the will of God. And so those talking about us, we're the stars that he's talking about. We are those descendants. So he says, you're going to have an earthly natural descendants from this earth, the Jewish nation, but there's going to be a whole other nation as numerous as the stars in heaven that is born not of the will of man, not of an earthly, but born of the will of God. And that's what it says in John 1, that those who believed in him, he gave the right, the privilege, the joy to become children of the living God. So number one, um, our obedience or our disobedience doesn't just affect us. This isn't all about us. We need to realize when we choose to obey God, we're affecting many around us. And most, mostly we're affecting those closest to us. Like the rock, when the rock drops in, the biggest ripple is right at the start, but it continues to ripple out. Those affected most are those closest to us. And that's why it's, it, it, we need to realize obedience makes such a difference, not just in our life, but in others. So principle number two, let's go back and look at this test. Again, this wasn't the first time that God had tested Abraham. He told him years ago, he said, I want you to leave your family. This is your home. I want you to leave that behind. Where am I going? I'll tell you when you get there. Just go where I tell you. That was a test to have to leave his family and leave, leave everybody behind, leave his home behind, everything he knew, to go to a place that he didn't know where it was. So that was a test. Then he, he was tested by, to give up. He had already sacrificed a son in a way. He had to give up Ishmael, and it broke his heart. Ishmael was his son just as much as Isaac was, but he was not the son of the promise through Sarah. And he had to let Ishmael go. He had to send Ishmael away. And God promised a blessing on Ishmael. God promised a blessing on Hagar. But he said it's through Isaac that the promise is going to come, that promise being speaking, of course, of Jesus, the Messiah. And so he had already given up a son, as it were. And now it just keeps getting harder. First of all, leave your family. Second of all, send your son away, probably to die in the wilderness for all the natural would have been, but God, of course, took care of them. And then thirdly, now, now take your son, this last one, the only one you have, take him up, offer him as a sacrifice. You plunge the knife into his heart. You light the fire. That, what a test. Probably the greatest test any man's ever gone through, except for Jesus, perhaps Job, too. But you see something here. On the other side of it, the greatest blessing, too, other than what was blessed upon Jesus for his obedience. Because Jesus' pit was even deeper than Abraham's pit. And so here's, here's the principle I see as this. is The deeper the valley you find yourself in, the higher the mountaintop on the other side. Or one way to put it, thinking about Joseph, would be the deeper the pit, the higher the peak. And so I, I've just seen this throughout Scripture. When someone is tested deeply, deeply, like Joseph was, he's literally thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. Well, that's bad. That's about as bad as it gets. No, it can be worse. You can be thrown into a prison to be forgotten. No possibility of parole, and you're just there for life. Nobody's going to come and bail you out of it. You're going to die there. That's about the deepest pitch you can get into. And then overnight, boom, he's at this second only to Pharaoh. So I've just seen those, you see those that are tested a little bit, like Gideon, for example. Now, it was a fearful test for him. It was a difficult time. He's tested once, one difficult time, and he comes out and he, he rules over the people for a while and his sons do for a while. And so, you know, little pit, little peak. Deep pit, huge peak. It's just, it's just something you see throughout the scriptures that they are commensurate. They, they collaborate? What would be the word? Compens anyway, equal. <laughs> the deeper the pit, the higher the peak. I don't know what that word is right now, but there's a great word for that. Correlate? That's a good word for it. There you go. The, those, the, the depth of the pit correlates with the height of the peak on the side. So, I tell you that because if you're in a really deep pit right now, hang in because there is a high peak on the other side. In fact, you might be praying, God, this, peak's not, this pit's not deep enough. I want things to get worse. Let them get worse, Lord, because I really, when I come out, Man, I'm looking for the victory on the other side, you know. I, I can't wait to get there, you know. If I live through this thing, it's really going to be good when I get out on the other side, you know. And if you don't live through it, well, the good is on the other side of eternity, right? So either way.
So it's just, it's just something, if you're in the pit right now, and we, we all have those times, we all go through those times of testing where sometimes it's a test of waiting. You feel like God has made you a promise or you feel like there's something you've been asking the Lord for and you keep knocking and knocking and seeking and seeking. And you, Lord, you said if I ask and ask and ask, I will receive if I seek and keep on seeking. And you've just been doing it and you've been doing it and, just, and it seems like nothing's coming. Sometimes that's the test we're going through. Sometimes that test is you've, you've got something even maybe good in your life and you feel like the Lord's saying, I want you to lay that down. You go, well, it's good. And maybe it's something even other people can do. Other Christians are involved in or can do. Or, or, and, and you can't, there's nothing wrong with it, but you just sense the Lord saying, I want you to put it down. Will, will you do that? And again, obedience, we don't understand it all. Abraham couldn't understand it. It made absolutely no sense why he should offer Isaac. But he obeyed. And on the other side, the peak was, was amazing. I'm going to be a bless you. So it's always that question of, will you obey me? Do you have to understand or will you just obey me because, because I'm God? And I, we all face those times. And, you know, here's the other thing. The first test of Abraham was leave your home and your family. Second test, and there were other tests in there too, you know, but then there was the test of send Ishmael away, which really broke his heart. And then there's the third test, which was just gut-wrenching, to offer my own son. And this isn't good news unless you look at the peak on the other side. I've seen in my life the same thing. Each test gets deeper and deeper, harder and harder. But the good news is this. It's like going to the gym. When you get there, you can't lift that big, heavy, 50-pound weight. <laughs> whatever the weight is that you can't lift. But you start with the little ones, right? And then when you get to this one that would have been like, I, that, I, I couldn't handle that. It would crush me. When you get there, you're prepared for it. And God is building us little poco a poco, little by little, strengthening us in our faith, purifying our faith. He's not going to overwhelm us. He builds that strength so that when we get to that bigger test, we're ready for it. And all this, remember, all this is all about, I love the little phrase, training for reigning. It's all in preparation. This whole life is just preparation for eternity. And so all this preparation, it's not wasted. It's, it's preparation for what we're going to do through eternity. And so I go, okay, this is tough. This is hard. This is really difficult. But if this is what it takes to prepare me for the position he wants for me, what he has for me to do in eternity, then bring it on. I'm just kind of kidding. Bring it on. <laughs> All right. By looking at the little promise here, I love this little phrase that comes up that became a saying among them, because I think that helps us when we go through those times of trial. And that was that this, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So when you're facing that difficult trial, what will be provided? My grace is sufficient for you. The, 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 the grace, you know, I love, the, I love this definition for grace. You know, the theologians use the term grace is the unmerited favor of God. Okay, well, that's, that's a good description, but that doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, I'm, okay, I get it. I love this definition of grace. Grace is the desire and the power to do the will of God. That, I like that. I call that an operational definition the desire and the power to do the will of God. So first of all, grace, uh, God's asking me to do something that's very difficult. Number one, I get the desire to do that because I desire to obey the Father, just like Jesus. He said, I don't want to do this, but I have the desire to obey the Father. So the desire to do the will of God, but if I have the desire, but I don't have the power to do it, that's not very helpful. So the desire comes, and then the power comes. As, as it said to Paul, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm going to give you the power necessary to carry this out. And if I have the power, but I don't have the desire to do it, that's not helpful either. I need both. I need to God to give me the desire to do His will, and then give me the ability, the power to do it. And that's what I believe grace is. When you read through the Bible, and you see the word grace, if you'll just stick in the desire and the power to do the will of God, it really makes it very... It kind of opens up some of those scriptures, like where, where uh, Paul prayed, take this thorn away from me, and the Lord says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. The desire that I'm going to put in you to do my will and the power I'm going to give you is going to be sufficient to get you through this thing. And so I, I just love that. But when we're in that time of testing, if we'll just remember, when, is it, when are we going to get the answer to it? 
on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. It's kind of like the old story, Corey Ten Boom, when she asked her dad, Papa, we're going to go get on the train and you haven't given me a ticket. When do I get the ticket? And, and Corey says, uh, Corey, when we get on the train, I'll give you the ticket. That's when you need it. I'll give it to you when you need it. And in a way, that's really sweet because Abraham didn't have to drag a ram all the way through those three days long with him. It was there waiting for him. And sometimes we get to where we're dragging stuff through life with us just because we might need it one of these days, you know, and, and not realizing that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like we've got a lot of draggers in here, you know, <laughs> drag stuff through life. Well, I might need that someday, you know, instead of realizing that, look, on the mountain of the Lord, when it's needed, God will provide it. Now, there's a balance in there, you know, preparing ahead, you know, Proverbs talks about wisdom and all that, you know, laying ahead. Well, the, the, the wood and the... He did take the wood. He was prepared. Yeah, yeah. So there is, there is a wisdom in that as well. Go with what's necessary. But sometimes we just drag too much, just in case I might need this. My son talks about one time they were going on the Inca Trail, and before he, he would lead teams on the Inca Trail, which you're three days, you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know. And he would always go through their backpack to uh, help lighten the load. And he would take stuff out and go, you're not going to need that. <gasps> I can't live without that. I'm gonna... And there was one where some lady had brought along a hairdryer. <laughs> yeah. And he, he took that out of Without my hairdryer for three days, honey, there ain't no electricity out there. You're not going to need a hairdryer. <laughs> you know? so, no, no. I remember a lady came down on a trip to Guatemala with us. She was all excited because just before she left, she'd gone to the dollar store and bought these little seat covers for the toilet, you know, toilet seats. We said, well, if you find a toilet seat to put that on, that's awesome. But you're probably not going to find a seat where we're going. So anyhow. So anyway, it's nice to know that on the mountain of the Lord, he will provide. He's faithful. So when, you, when you're there and you need it, he's going to provide it. One of the early church fathers they were saying that God doesn't provide adequately for Christians. They're always the poorest of the poor. And he said, you don't realize that we are just travelers in this earth. We're just passing through. And I love what he said. And if you've done much traveling, you can appreciate this. He says, and a traveler is happier the lighter his load. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Never see, I always think of that when I'm going through an airport. So I see people dragging 15 bags yeah. behind them. Sometimes that's us dragging 15 bags. We're going on the mission field. We're taking people. I had a guy ask me to bring him a lawnmower in the Philippines one time, and I could not figure a way to get him a lawnmower, but I did get him the weed eater he asked for. You know, I managed to stuff that in a duffel bag and get him, couldn't figure a way to get the lawnmower into a suitcase. But anyway, so sometimes we're the ones, that, and, and then when I'm pulling the 15 bags too, I'm thinking, oh man, a traveler is happier, the lighter is load. And when we're going through this world, lighten the load, trust God on the mountain of the Lord it will prov be provided. So number one, the first thing is, hey, um, what we do affects others. It's not just all about us. Number two, if you're in a deep pit, hey, the mountain on the other side, when God brings you out, the view you're going to have, the peak is comparable to the pit. The deeper the pit, the higher the peak. So God has a good plan for you. And he's bringing that. And then number three, on the mountain of the Lord, when you need it, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And so we, we walk and live and trust him. We see that Abraham did. We see that Jesus did. It says that because Jesus laid aside the glory of heaven, humbled himself, Philippians 2, God has exalted him and given him a name above every name. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Keep going. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Isn't that great?